So today we are continuing in the, uh, sorry, the series of Luke that we've been doing, which I have enjoyed. I don't know about you guys. Um, Luke is one of my favorite um, of the biblical authors that God used to tell Jesus's story. Um, part of that might be because he talks about women more um, than the others. And part of it might be because he adds lots of details, and I'm that person that over-explains over everything. Um, so I really like Luke. Um, I'm just getting to... Here we go. All right, so today we're, we're looking at Mary and Martha. So I'm excited about it, um, which... I've heard the story a million times. I don't know about you guys. I've, I've heard about it, I've read about it, um, but God always seems to do something different when I actually take the time to slow down and really sit with a passage for weeks, and he did it again. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into the text. So it says, while they were traveling, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Obviously, this is Jesus we're talking about. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Awkward. We can presume that he acknowledged that that was the situation, because he says, so tell her to help me. <laughs> But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken from her. Now, Martha kind of grabbed my attention this time as I went through this text. Um, Mary always kind of gets, you know, the praise of being the one who got it right, you know. But I want to take a closer look at Martha, who she was why she did what she did. So Martha was the matron of the household. Um, we don't know a lot of details about her, but we know she was the sister of Lazarus and that Mary was the younger sister. Um, they may have been unmarried, which would put them on the younger side, or they may have been widowed. But usually it seems like in the New Testament, widows are identified as widows. Um, so Martha is the oldest sister, and Mary is younger, and it doesn't talk about Lazarus here, but he's their brother. And in a Jewish household, the girls were brought up a very particular way, and that was with traditional Jewish hospitality, which, if you've ever experienced it, is kind of like being treated like royalty just because you went over to a friend's house. Um, it was ingrained in girls from a very young age, that, and it was an expected trait in a woman. Like, you wouldn't marry a woman who would not be able to host everyone who might come to your home, especially an honored guest. So by adulthood, it was pretty much automatic. Someone comes to your home, you welcome them. You give them the seat of honor. You bring out the drinks. You bring out the food. You serve and honor them while they are in your home. So we're going to look at another example just to kind of give you an idea of how ingrained this is. In Luke chapter 4, we're going to hop back to a passage that we kind of touched on briefly before, but it, it was kind of in the mix of a bunch of stories. So in Luke 4, 38 and 39, it says that Jesus, um, after he went to the synagogue, so he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon is, you know, Simon Peter, that we all know as one of the apostles. And Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up immediately and began to serve them. Like, she was laying in bed on death's door, as far as traditional medicine of the time knew. And when she's healed and she comes to and sees that there are people in her home. And it's not even her home. It's Simon's home. So it's, you know, her daughter's home. Her daughter should be hosting these people. And she jumps out of bed <laughs> and says, I'm, I got to go get drinks. We need snacks. Like, what's everybody doing here not being the honored guests that, you know, we're supposed to 
treat them as. It was so automatic that no one even had to say like, hey, can I get a glass of water? Which, I'm American. If you come to my house, I will forget that you might need a drink. So please just help yourself to the kitchen because <laughs> like in our culture it's more like make yourself at home meaning act like your family and get it yourself you know that wasn't the culture here <laughs> she's like I need to get a drink for everyone I need to provide food for everyone and it wasn't even her house so if that gives you an idea of what Martha is brought up to do you can see why you know with an honored rabbi in her home and his disciples sitting listening to his teaching, the only place she could possibly think to be is serving. As if that's not enough pressure, all of these girls grew up with, the next slide, <laughs> with this, or at least chunks of it, being read over them every week on Shabbat, at Shabbat dinner. I mean, a lot of us, at least if you grew up in more conservative circles, like had study groups that would go through Proverbs 31, and at the end of it, you're like, I am so inspired, and inside you're like, I might kill myself before I actually become like that, because it's impossible, you know? And it's a beautiful description of a wonderful woman. It, it really, like it's not meant to scare us away. It is meant to inspire us, but most of us don't behave like that. But Martha grew up with this being one of the honored texts that describes a woman of God. And one of the things described in there is hospitality. So it's no wonder that Martha had a very high and particular expectation for herself and her sister, who apparently forgot all that training. So now we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of compare real quick just to get Mary and Martha in our minds. So we've got Martha. She's well-trained in household duties. She's probably pretty well off um, because she's equipped to host a large group. That's Jesus and his 12 disciples and anyone else who happened to be following him, which usually there is a few extras at least. And clearly she had a high value for Jesus and wanted to serve him well. Now, she may or may not have known at that point that he's the Messiah. It doesn't say explicitly, but he's at least an honored rabbi, if not a prophet, if not the Messiah. Clearly, she's going to know exactly what to do and pull out all the stops. But Mary, well, she's also a young Jewish girl and also well-trained in household duties. Now, she's not the matron of the house, but she is expected to assist with hosting. It was just an expectation across the board. You know, the guys are going to go sit and talk about the deep theological things, and the women are going to be in the kitchen making them a sandwich. That's where Mary should have been, right? But Mary also had a high value for Jesus and wanted to know him well. And that ends up being the key difference that usually we focus on when we're reading the story of Mary and Martha. We're like, yeah, Mary knew what was really important. And she did. And it's good. Like, we really do need to learn from Mary to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and make time to be in his presence. But I think just a little correction in our minds that we tend to do the next slide. We, we tend to do this. We're like, Mary got it right. And Martha, she tried. But, you know, she's Martha. And we talk about Mary as the example, and, you know, and sometimes we'll even say, oh, I've had a Martha week. I have. Like, this is probably my most hypocritical sermon yet, because <laughs> this whole month has been one of those where you're like, I need to stop. I need to sit with Jesus. I need to slow down. And it's like the enemy knew that I was supposed to be preaching on this. So, you know, if I will walk with a limp a little bit today, it's because I have some broken toes. <laughs> but... Jesus doesn't approach the situation this way, where one person is put on a pedestal. He does affirm Mary's choice. He does say Mary made the right choice, and it will not be taken from her. But he doesn't tell Martha, like, gosh, you screwed up, demoted. You know, maybe Mary should have been the older sister, because clearly she's the smarter one. 
No. Jesus reaches out and acknowledges her effort, and he doesn't condemn or rebuke, but he invites her to something better. Now, have you ever worked really hard on something? Like, you're really invested. You're like, I am going to give this my best. But you still get kind of a bad grade, or you get reprimanded at work, or you get fired. And you're like, I thought I was doing, like, the best that I could. Like, you know, and I thought I was doing it right. Anybody? Is it just me? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so I have. So first off, before I tell this story, I'm not going to tell you where I was serving in this role because I want you to go sign up for whatever ministry God might put on your heart. When you hear somebody saying, sign up to serve in life, kids, sign up for our welcome team, like, don't go, oh, I don't know, because Kristen had that one time where it just, you know, she derailed it, and I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to sit in the pews and, because that's not what we're called to do. So, I was doing a thing in the church, and I was in that role for years, and I showed up early, and I stayed late, and I signed up often, and I brought my kids. They were, you know, following behind me all over the church, just, you know, sometimes I would tell them, like, go play in the nursery. Just don't make a mess. Like, you don't have to do what I'm doing, but just, you know, do the kid thing. Go play. You're okay, because I was going, and I would fill in at a moment's notice, and I served so faithfully, but I was not doing well. In fact, I had so much stress. I had headaches constantly. On Sundays, I would end up completely overwhelmed and overstimulated and exhausted, and every Sunday night was a migraine evening, and I would leave church having zero patience for my kids, and I dreaded coming to church. But they needed me. Because, I mean, they said the, the sign-up thing. So, so I needed to, like, not quit on them when they're asking for sign-ups, right? We do our duty. Add on top of that that, like Martha, I was raised in churches that said women can only be in this role, this role, or this role. So that narrows it down. But please, still sign up. But this finally came to Pastor Tim's attention and we started talking about like okay why do you serve in this role is this the role for you and I said well they they really need people you know and I can do this I said but should you well yeah they need people but should you I can't quit on them right now And he looked me straight in the face and said, do I need to fire you? (laughs) And it was a gift. It was such a gift because he knew that I would put others before myself to the point of not just a fault. It was not just a fault. It was a sin. Because I was putting everyone else before my family I was having all of my patience for while I was here, and then I would go home and be just a mess. That's not how God calls us to serve. And Jesus didn't rebuke Martha for serving. The thing that he corrected was how she viewed her sister, who was doing a different ministry. So what Jesus says to Martha is not, how dare you serve? He says, what you're doing is good, but there's something better. And that's what Pastor Tim said when he said, do I need to fire you? (laughs) Because there was something that I should be doing, and that wasn't it. And I can tell you from experience, there's a huge difference between being exhausted because you poured yourself into something that God created you to do and equipped you to do, and you spent time with him pouring it into you, and then you poured it out from an overflow of being with him. There's a huge difference between that 
and showing up early and staying late and signing up for all the things and never saying no and ending up completely burned out. It's different. You can feel tired from serving Jesus. Jesus felt tired from doing his work. But it's different when it's what you were made to do. The question that I asked, though, when I kind of made this connection that Jesus was calling Martha to something deeper was what did she do with it? And the thing is, Scripture doesn't actually tell us, like, oh, and then Martha sat down at Jesus' feet and looked at her sister and said, thank you for being such a good example. I've learned so much from you. Please continue, Rabbi. We, We don't know how she reacted. She might have stalked off to the kitchen to keep serving. She might have felt like she was really put on the spot being corrected in front of everybody, even though Jesus, I'm sure, did it lovingly. We don't know what she did, but we do know what happens the next time she interacts with Jesus. And if we hop over to John 11, Lazarus has died. And when Jesus arrives, Martha is the first one to interact with him. So let's just read a handful of verses and see how Martha seems to respond the next time. It says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. Hmm. So she knows that he's got a connection at least. Seems she's given a little more thought to Jesus. But Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. Lord, not rabbi, not bruh. Even though some people believe that they grew up together. She says, yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. I'm pretty sure I've heard that before. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And we say that all the time, because we're on the other side of it. We know that he died and actually came back to life and, you know, the whole story. But these people didn't. So clearly, what Jesus said to her that day made her realize there are important things that I need to sit with. And she did. Now, out of curiosity, even though it might be considered a bunny trail, I looked it up, and sure enough, I had heard those words before in Matthew 16. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responded. Now, we don't get to find out his response to Martha because she runs off and gets Mary. It's kind of a a reverse of the previous situation, but, you know. But Jesus responds to Simon Peter and says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it to Martha either, but the Father in heaven. This kind of faith, this bold confession, this church-founding declaration that Peter made famous, Martha had it too. Now, last time, she could have served Jesus as an honored rabbi or a prophet, or maybe she did believe that he was the Messiah and was simply serving him in the best way that she knew how. But now it's clear. Now she's face-to-face with him, and she's the first one to reach out. When she heard that he was coming, 
She was the one to book it, to be in his presence. But what about Mary? Well, she got it right the first time. So how'd that work out for her? Well, the next time we hear about Mary interacting with Jesus, sounds like she's doing pretty good on the faith journey too. In John chapter 12, so this is after Jesus has raised Lazarus, and it's on a, a separate day because we know based on context that at this point people were talking about killing Jesus and Lazarus. Not that he did anything, poor guy. So six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them. So apparently she still knows what she's good at, but she's probably doing it from a bit of a different perspective. And that thing I said about there's a difference in being tired from the right thing versus the wrong thing, I think she's probably getting it right this time. So Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair. I'm not doing that, just for the record. I like my hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, which I looked it up, and nard is a type of essential oil that comes from a plant that's related to honeysuckles, and it smells very sweet. So, fun fact for you. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas, of course it's Judas, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denar denarii and given to the poor? That's about a year's wages. It's like 300 days worth of money. But he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of it, or part of what was put into it. Kind of irrelevant. But Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. So Mary is right where she was before, at Jesus' feet, but this time she does something different. Last time she was listening, and this time she is performing an act of service. And not just any act of service. She met a need that he didn't have yet. How did she do that? Like, have you ever some, had somebody give you a gift that you're like, oh my gosh, you have no idea how much I needed this? That's me every time I get a Starbucks gift card. <laughs> but Jesus knew that he was going to die. And he'd even said it to his disciples, but they didn't seem to get it. They were like confused every time, as if he couldn't possibly mean that. But Mary had been listening. She'd been with him. She knew Jesus, and she knew that he was the Messiah and what he came to do, because she was paying attention. So when he talked about his coming death and all the other disciples were lost, Mary got it. And so when she brought that perfume and performed that act of worship, it was more relevant than the others thought. So to know where he's going, we need to be where he is. That was the important thing that Mary nailed, was that, like, sometimes we'll hear a, a message from God, you know, something like, oh, like, God just put this thing on my heart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to, you know, jump out of my seat and go, you know, run to do the thing. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. I I had some more details for you, but okay, this will be interesting. We'll come back to it. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're too eager to serve, and we do like Martha. But to know what he's doing elsewhere, or to know what he's planning on doing, or even to know what he has been doing in other people's lives, we have to actually hang around. We need to be where he is. So our service, whatever that looks like, whatever you're called to, the thing that you were made for or the thing that he puts on your heart to do or that word that someone gives you, this God calling out a gift in you, when that is acted on, our service needs to bear witness to our withness. Because in Scripture, whenever someone did something right after Jesus had gone back up to heaven, like, the answer, the, the response was, whoa, these guys have been with Jesus. 
And Jesus was gone. They couldn't even be like, oh, well, he was over there giving them a lesson about how to cast out demons, and then they came over here and did the thing. I see how it works. No, they knew they had a reputation of having been with Jesus and that they couldn't have been doing all the things that he called them to do if they hadn't been with Jesus. And we need to make sure that we're doing it that way too. So in the initial story of Mary and Martha, we have one doing for Jesus, which is good, and one being with Jesus, which is good, but we need both. I love how Pete Scazzaro puts it when he says, we need a being with Jesus that will sustain our doing for Jesus. And they both learned, you know, basically what Pete was saying. We need to be with him. Otherwise, when we're doing for him, we're just going to crash and burn. It might take longer or happen faster depending on what we're doing for him. But if we're not spending time with him, to know what he's doing, what he's called us to, you know, how he wants us to carry out his instructions, it's not going to go well. Now, when we first met Mary and Martha, it was Mary who chooses the life-giving, heart-changing presence of Jesus, giving him the best thing that she has, which was her full attention. And it is Martha who gives what she has to give, which is her service. But another piece Gazzaro quote, we cannot give what we do not possess, and we cannot help but give what we do possess. You think about that? Like, you know the phrase, hurt people hurt people? It's like that is what this means, like, or this is what that means. This is a better way of saying that. When all we put into our lives or all that we have had put on us is hurt and shame and unrealistic expectations and trauma and, you know, all the things, because we all have something, you know, some little T trauma or we have that bully from school or we had that, you know, parent who we were never good enough for. And when that's what's inside us, that is what we give out because we give out of the overflow of whatever it is. So it's Martha who, she starts out where she can't help but give what she has, which is a sense of duty and high expectations and judgment toward Mary's audacious devotion to this rabbi who, like, who do you think you are? You're a woman. Disciples are men. Like... She's got all kinds of judgment. But when we meet them again, it's Martha who pursues the compassionate, heart-soothing presence of Jesus. And she goes to urge Mary back to his feet because she's learned the importance of time there. And the third time, Martha and Mary, they're both fully invested in Jesus' life and ministry, and they pour out their gifts and their service and the overflow of their devotion to him. Now, if you don't know what's inside can you predict what's going to flow out or if you don't have an idea of where you've been feeding from do you know what you're gonna like what's gonna come out first it's one of those things that it happens whether we think about it or not like discipleship if you're a disciple of something who are you learning from youtube influencer or, you know, Fox News, or some celebrity. They have really cool products, and they're all color-coordinated. Sorry, that's my weak spot. Like, they have such cute exercise equipment at Target. Do you exercise? But they're so cute. (laughs) See, we're influenced by things that we don't even think about. So sometimes we need to do a little personal inventory. Because some of us are really good at the Mary stuff. Lots of being with Jesus, but then we don't do anything with it. And some of us are really good at the first Martha stuff. And like the list of things that we want to do for Jesus and things that we're signing up for is a mile long, but like we haven't read our Bible in months or had any like good time sitting in prayer or listening to the Holy Spirit. 
And sometimes we're carrying things that were never meant to put on us. Things that you know, we, we might need someone to say, do you need to be fired from that? And it might be a sin issue. It might be just a bad habit, or it might be overcommitment. So in the seats in front of you, there's little pieces of paper. Looks kind of like this. And it's just to help you do a little personal inventory of what things are you doing with Jesus, what things are you doing for Jesus, and what things do you need to step away from? What things need to just happen without you? Because sometimes the things in that last category are good things. That ministry I was doing before, it's still a thing. There are people doing it. There are people who were made to do it. And if all of us are doing the things that God made us to do, it'll all get done. Now, if we have a mass exodus of people ditching the ministries they've signed up for, we're going to have a problem. So don't get too hung up on that one. (laughs) But a good rule of thumb is try to make the with Jesus list at least as long as the for Jesus list. So if you can just spend a couple minutes thinking, say, God, what am I doing with my time, with my energy, with my life? What am I doing with your presence? Because he offers it all the time. But how often do we actually sit down and accept his invitation? And if we're not accepting his invitation, how are we going to serve him? I mean, sure, we could do a thing, but we might do it wrong. Or we might do it too much. Or we might do it too little. Or we might do it really resentfully. So what are we doing with Jesus? And what are we doing for Jesus? And what do we need to stop doing. Now on the next slide, I, I gave a few examples, kind of filled it out hypothetically, just in case you need something to get you started. If you can take a few minutes and jot down things that come to mind. And then, before you leave today, and this will be really easy because you'll be sitting down having pancakes for a while, share with a friend Now, I'm not saying you have to tell them all the ways that you've failed and all the ways that you need to do better and all the things that you need to give up. But you're more likely to act on something if you share it with somebody. So even if it's one other person and it's just one of the things on the list, the thing that you really feel like God is saying, you need to do more of this or you need to do less of that. Have a partner to help you get back in balance so that you are serving and loving other people out of the overflow of your time with Jesus. Because we can't give him our best unless we're willing to receive his best for us. All right, so I'm I'm just going to play a breath. Wow. Pray a blessing (laughs) over you guys, and then we can go get some pancakes. Jesus, thank you for welcoming us to sit at your feet Thank you for every one of us that you made us your disciples, that you welcome us regardless of where we are. Pour out every bit of yourself onto my friends here today. May they get comfortable being covered in the dust of you, our rabbi. May they experience new depths of your presence, intimate knowledge of your work in their sphere of influence, and an overflow of your deposit in them, that those who encounter these disciples of yours would see that their lives bear witness to their witness as they live close to you every day. In your name, amen.